Okay, we're going to call this meeting of the uh, work session for the Board of Mayor and Alderman to order now. Uh, this is the meeting for February 14th, 2023. Uh, first item is for me to call the roll. Vice Mayor? Here. Alderman Blanton? Here. Alderman Hansen? Here. Alderman Peterson? Here. Alderman Berger? Present. Alderman Brown? Present. Alderman Potts? Present. And Alderman Baggett? Present. And the Mayor is here also. So uh, the next item on the agenda is an opportunity for... Uh, citizen comments on items that are not on the agenda. Uh, I think most of you know the routine speaker card. If you're going to speak on an item not on the agenda, I don't have any, but I do have speaker cards for other items. If you feel so urged that you want to speak tonight, give me the cards now because my tendency is not to accept them one hour into the meeting. So, Okay, we'll move on to the 2022 Development Activity Report. So uh, one of the things we do is quarterly reports to you on development activity. This time is not just the quarter, but it's the full calendar year of 2022 to give you sort of an oversight of, of what we've seen in terms of that activity this past year. And Catherine Harrelson is here to bring it to you again. So take it away, Catherine. Thanks, Eric. Um, I will try and be quick. I know we have a very heavy agenda. Um, Tonight for the calendar year uh, development report, we're gonna go through some of the um, largest parts of development services. That would be plan review, permitting, our typical fees and valuation numbers, um, addressing housing, and then I wanna touch on a few of our boards and commissions that are particularly involved with development services. Um, first up is plan review, and just for some education, this is the first stage of development services. This is where uh, developers, design professionals will submit plans to staff for review and staff will then provide, um, uh, provide comments based on the codes and ordinances that are approved by the Board of Mayor and Aldermen and also by the Planning Commission. Um, staff maintains a service commitment which guarantees plan reviews or plans will be reviewed and uh, given back with comments to applicants in a timely manner. Um, if you want to see more into what our service commitments are, we have that on our banner outside of our Building and Neighborhood Services Department, as well as in the BNS webpage on our website. Um, and I want to touch on quickly the plans that we did review. This is based on our design review team um, <coughs> agendas, and for development plans, we reviewed 15. Um, site plans, we reviewed 60. And final plats, we reviewed, we reviewed 56. Um, and I also have on the other side our average review cycles. On uh, Typically, a plan will go through three reviews. That's initial submittal, resubmittal, and a one-stop review. So if you look at development plans, it averages about 4.3 reviews. Um, site plans is about five. And typically with site plans, that's your, gonna be your most detailed plans that are submitted. Um, and then final plats were at about 2.8 reviews. Next part is permitting. This is one of the biggest functions in our building and neighborhood services department. And you can see why with all the things in the city that require a permit. Um, typically all new construction, renovations, and additions will require a permit. Those are our building permits that we issue. Um, but we have a variety of other permits that we work on as well. Um, one of them is trade permits. This is the ones that we issue the most. This is your electrical, plumbing, and mechanical work. Um, we also have use permits, which are your short-term vacation rentals, your outdoor cafes, and your mobile food vendors. And on top, we also um, issue permits for things like swimming pools and for signage. And to break down the permits that we issued in 2022, for building permits, we issued a little over 1,000 permits. Um, trade, as I said earlier, is our most issued. We issued a little over 4,500 permits. Um, and then with swimming pools, we issued 78 permits last year. And if you look at the permits issued in the last five years, and especially in the last four years, we've been pretty consistent. In 2022, we issued 5,806 permits, which is pretty much breaking even with where we were last year with 5,790. Next, I wanna talk about fees. I have this slide here just to um, kind of focus on the differences between the two fees that I usually, two types of fees that I usually report on. First is our permit fees. 
Um, these fees are based off the construction value of the project that's being permitted. We usually request that information when you apply for a building permit. Um, these collections will go to the general fund and they help fund our operations throughout the city. Um, and then we have impact fees. These are fees that are directly tied to the development's impact on city infrastructure. So our roads, water, sanitary, sewer, parks, et cetera. Um, and we try to keep all of our fees updated regularly um, to keep up with growth. That is our goal. Um, but with our impact fee collections in 2022, with road impact, we collected about $3.38 million. And with water and sewer, we collected about $2.5 million. Um, you'll note that there, that's a pretty sizable decrease from 2021. However, this is really just the snapshot in time with which permits have been issued. Um, if you look at, if you remember back to our fiscal year 22 um, report that the impact fees were not as different and that's just because of the timing with which permits come out. Um, if you'll, for an example, we issued a foundation permit for McEwen Northside in 2021, which was when fees were paid. That was about a million dollars in road impact that was recorded in 2021, but the building permit was not issued until 2022. So just, just to note that just because the fees are lower, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, development is slowing or going down. And to kind of bring that point back with construction valuation, this is a kind of a metric that we use to show the level of investment that's happening in Franklin. Um, and in 2022, the building permit valuation totaled over 80, eight, totaled $847 million, which is a 57% increase from 2021. So we're still seeing a lot of investment happening in the community, spe specifically with large projects that have a high construction value. And this slide is again to show you in the last five years what the construction valuation has really looked like. Um, you can see the significant increase between 2021 and 2022 being at $874 million. Um, next, I want to talk about housing. In 2022, we permitted about 948 dwelling units. Um, this is the fifth year in a row that we've issued permits for over 900 units. And the, break, the way that this breaks down, um, for single family, we permitted for 212 new homes, 214 new townhomes, and 522 multifamily units. I do want to note with multifamily, that comes, most of it comes from one development. And that was McEwen Northside. That was 428 units. So the vast majority just came from one development. And then um, I want to touch on boards and commissions. Um, this is not all of our boards or commissions that are involved in development services, but I feel as though these three should be highlighted. Um, these three really help make sure that, uh, that staff stays engaged with the development community just in different ways. Um, first, you have our Development Services Advisory Commission, which Alderman Brown serves on. This is a recommending body. It provides guidance and recommendation to the board on the city's development review processes or any policies. Um, there's also the Building and Street Standards Board of Appeals. This, is, um, this and the Stormwater Appeals Board are different. This is a technical body that's there to hear appeals on decisions um, or determinations that are relating to our technical codes or to um, such as with the Building and Street Standards, our building and fire codes and with the Stormwater Appeals Board with our stormwater ordinances. So I feel like it's really good to highlight this is that we do provide avenues to hold staff accountable as well. And I wanna highlight in meetings, Development Services Advisory Commission meets once a month, second Wednesday at 7.30 a.m. in the City Hall training room. Um, but the Building and Street Standards and Stormwater Appeals Board only meet when necessary and to show that in 2022, building and street standards only met once. And Stormwater Appeals Board didn't meet in 2022 and in fact has not met since 2019. So I, um, I just wanted to highlight that because I think it really shows that staff tries to really work with the development community to come up with solutions before it goes to this step and we have to go through this process. And lastly, I just thought this would be fun since it's the 2022 
um, Roundup. This is the big projects that were either finished or are uh, under construction now. Um, I wanted to highlight the Williamson County Animal Center completed construction and opened in 2022. It's a beautiful facility. Um, Columbia State Arts and Technology Building is currently under construction. Um, McEwen Northside is a popular one tonight, but they're under construction currently is multifamily. And if you look at the residential side, we have single family in Southbrook being constructed, as well as townhomes being built in Simmons Ridge. And I also want to highlight for affordable housing, the Cherokee townhomes are currently under construction um, with Franklin Housing Authority. And lastly, if um, anybody would like more information, um, they're welcome to visit the Development and Building Services webpage on our website. I try and keep that updated regularly. And if you all would like any information or resources added to that, feel free to reach out to Eric and Vernon. I would be more than happy to add anything that you all would like. So with that, happy to take any questions. Great, Alderman Berger. Great report, by the way. Thank you so much. It's very thorough. and. Um, interesting numbers <laughs> um, do you know if we've had uh, many new mobile food vendor uh, applications I was just curious about that that seemed to grow quite quickly and then I was wondering if it I do not know that number off the top of my head um, you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there were any new ones in the last sorry I, I don't know the exact number no. we have we have a few um, five to ten throughout the year and um, yeah, there was certainly a growth in that through the pandemic, yeah. but in the last year, it's kind of plateaued and settled out. But. Yeah. Okay. And how about the short-term vacation rentals? Have we had many applications for that? I was just curious because we've redone that ordinance. Yeah, there's um, those are that's an annual renewal, and sorry, we don't have that exact number. Oh. There's about 180 <coughs> active in the city, okay. and they renew on an annual basis. <coughs> um, that's something you'll hear about in. The, uh, yeah, a couple of months when we have our budget presentation also <laughs> as we we are looking at a software to better track the active short-term vacation rentals also um, but yeah it's about 180 and it varies a little bit from year to year okay thanks so much any other questions ready to move on item two resolution 2023-07 a resolution of support restoring the historic revenue sharing relationship between the state of Tennessee and its local governments and to return the local share of the single article cap to local governments. Uh, this is the same resolution that we passed last year. Uh, this is uh, something that the Tennessee Municipal League is, has been working on for several years. Uh, I can tell you that it's not in the governor's budget at this point. Uh, we hope that we might be able to get into the governor's budget whenever it's amended. Uh, there are several bills that address this. I don't remember the numbers uh, that uh, are in the General Assembly and the one that generally uh, I think that uh, TML is supporting is the one by Senator Briggs. So I, I don't remember the House sponsor. So um, any questions about that? Two, two key things I would just highlight for you. And you, this is on for the voting session as well. We want to try to get uh, this statement out to our legislators and just generally show our support. But overall, 90% of sales tax generated in the state of Tennessee is generated in cities. And so there had been a historic pattern of how that revenue was shared back out to cities per capita, dates back to the 1940s. And when the state was in financial hard times in the early 2000s, uh, the sales tax was increased and, and cities agreed to take less of a cut to help the state out. Uh, and so those times are obviously past us. We have a state that's been generating record surpluses over the last several years. Uh, the other related element is the state has continued to collect what's called the single article. So they'll collect local sales, they'll collect sales tax up to $1,600. And then the local government gets no more sales tax from that. From 1600 to 3200, the state will collect all of that. Even the local portion goes all to the state, none of it to the local governments or to the places in which it was generated. And so uh, 
that is, and that, that takes dollars not only away from city government, but also to public schools, because every dollar we get in local sales tax, a dollar also goes to public schools. So um, those are two areas that, that, since the state's in a much better financial situation, those were things that were done in hard times to give the state some additional capacity to address those problems. Those times are past us, and so we'd like to get back to a more historic and, and consistent way with, with how those revenues have been shared between governments and to recognize the, the costs and burdens that fall on local governments to support uh, economic activity. So uh, I think that covers what we're, what we're talking about, and, and again, it's on for a vote tonight as well to express our support for restoring that. Item three is uh, ordinance 2022-47, an ordinance mm -hmm. to amend ordinance 2022-03, amending title 16 for public gathering and expression events. I think Shauna's coming up here. We wanted to follow back up on the discussion we had uh, um, a couple weeks ago related to public expressions. Um, we have some of the elements we talked about before. Um, I know you may have some folks that want to speak to it in the public, but uh, primarily there were four broad topics I think we wanted to follow up with you on and get guidance on, on what changes, you, what changes if any, you want to make to the existing ordinance. Uh, and we also want to provide some additional information, first being amplification and noise. So some of the discussion had been what's on the books related to amplification and noise now. We can walk you through some of those elements and some of that's included in your packet and how that might be applied to um, public gatherings and expression events. The restrictions that have been talked about for the downtown district on Friday and Saturday evenings, that's a topic uh, that had been identified with some interest. The overall prohibition for uh, events after dark citywide. And then finally, just the, the, the idea of how you wanna deal with reoccurring events. Do you wanna allow multiple uses uh, week after week or over multiple days in the same public location or how you want to manage that because the, the existing ordinance had for reoccurring permitted events um, a once per month permit uh, and again as this first bullet shows the way it's written now if it's fewer than 20 attendees and there's not amplification it does not constitute an event that requires any kind of permit um, so uh, that, that's just kind of a reminder to us about what an event threshold is. Um, so, Mayor, I don't know if you'd like us to move into the discussion of the individual items or if you want to hear from the public or what would you like to do? We could. We, got, we have one more slide just kind of like throw up there. Just see, um, sure. Okay. We were asked last time we met a little bit about noise in general and what our noise ordinances say. And so I thought it might be easier to kind of divide it up into two separate kind of buckets. One is public noise, so noise that would happen in the public rights of way or in our parks versus noise that might happen either on someone's private property or a commercial establishment. And um, you can kind of see that if it's on public property, generally, if it's, if it's a certain type of noise, amplification, that kind of thing, it's regulated by permit. And then if it happens on roads, and I know we've talked about noises that happen on roads, or we, there's a code that talks about um, amplification on roads. Uh, there's a blanket prohibition on any <coughs> sidewalk, roads, rights of way, any amplification at all is a blanket prohibition. The way you get around that is through permits. Um, and then there's also a section in the code that talks about racing and screeching of tires. But the part that I thought was real interesting is the blanket prohibition on amplification citywide on any streets and sidewalks. Um, and then again, there are noises that happen in the parks and those are generally uh, regulated by a use agreement that you might have if you wanted to you know, rent out a gazebo or have a birthday party. There's some regulations that you would put um, in place for parks. For private noise, um, we have a chapter in our municipal code called um, Offenses Against the Peace and Quiet. And that really regulates sound at someone's private residence or at their commercial establishment. Um, it generally says that you don't amplify where you can hear it. Now, you can still amplify, but not where you can hear it past 100 feet after 10, between 10 and 7, Sunday through Thursday, and 11 
through 7, Friday and Saturday. And that kind of addresses our restaurants that might have live music that you can hear outside of the establishment. You can still amplify in a private business so long as you can't hear it outside of the business 100 feet from the property line. Mm -hmm. um, and some sounds are just generally declared uh, loud and unnecessary. And those are kind of listed in Chapter 4. Um, they're like... Of odd animal sounds that you might have. There's some, there's some things that just say in and of themselves are, are loud and unnecessary, but that's things that would happen at your private property. I did want you to kind of see how, how they're different, how we, we have to look at you know, use of your private residence versus, or commercial establishment versus the, the public rights of way. Some of you may remember on this noise uh, component, the offense against peace and quiet that, that gets at the, the more private use. We spent probably the better part of a year <laughs> talking about that and moving from where we used to have like decibel readings and all this kind of stuff to something that was a little more plain English and understandable about distance from property lines so that it would be a little, little easier to understand and to enforce uh, and, and as opposed to talking about calibrating and getting readings and all this kind of stuff. So we did go through that as it relates to those, uh, just as a reminder that, that the kind of the progression we've, we made uh, several years ago related to that. But that, that was a, we spent a lot of time going through and trying to figure that out in a way that was clear and understandable, did differentiate on a, kind of the weekend nights or the fr Friday and Saturday nights versus other, other times of the week. But um, just add a little context to that. So could, could you tell us what necessitated us to do that because we we did deal with some issues and I just thought maybe you could clarify that a little bit. What I remember and others may want to clarify, I, I, I remember hearing several complaints around establishments that had music and were amplifying uh, you know late into the night, different times. Some of this also relates to one of the things with sound is different at atmospheric or weather conditions affect how far it carries. And so we dealt with some of that too and, and what you could read adjacent to it, what, but what you might hear even farther away was different. And so we tried to come up with something that was a little more understandable, but it came from essentially, uh, what I remember is some residential and, and citizen complaints around specific establishments that had either live music or were amplifying music as part of their establishment, their operations. And, and I, I would just, Ms. Ray, if, you, if I may. Go ahead, uh, and I'll have all of them I, I just want to clarify that. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I just want to say that those were uh, specific complaints that came to City Hall. Mm -hmm. They were written down. They were complaints that came in. We had people going up and down Main Street with amplification uh, in front of uh, businesses and and we like people playing on the sidewalk. It's part of it's part of the Music City whole atmosphere we have here, and we like it. Uh, but we had some amplification that was going down the street, and then there was somebody else playing on the other corner, and then there was businesses that had had some issues with that. And then we had a few people with bull horns, and a few other things. I remember all the way back to 2006 that happened. So I just wanted to clarify that. So it wasn't just we just didn't pull that out there. Go ahead, Oliver Brown. Uh, so th I just had a clarification. I mean, ideally, again, my hope was we just can handle this in the noise ordinance and not have to create all new ordinances around this stuff. So I felt like I felt like there was enough language in all of this to maybe do that. I read that that section around amplification of sound in the mixed use districts, what I would which I would consider downtown area to be. It it said and and it, it basically lays out exactly what you say there in terms of time frame and unless you have a permit mm -hmm. um, but it didn't it didn't sound to me like that emanated from a building in fact it stops at um, where where a permit is obtained um, except for where an, 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 a permit is obtained so that's section 3 of 11403 seemed like that would be encompassing enough to be able to address any noise concerns we would have within a mixed use district I mean even the commercial and industry I mean even if we decided this wasn't mixed use commercial and that seems to still provide that buffer 
area in addition to the public noise piece on street like it just it seems like we have what we need there again in the in the case where noise became an issue it seems like we have what we need there without having to create all new yeah well I will say that in this section it was really contemplated amplification within a building that you could see here outside the building and and the reason it's kind of laid out this way and you'll you kind of see it in that last sentence about if if you've got one permit, then no other permit will be granted because right. you don't want competing amplification sounds in the public rights of way. So this was really kind of contemplated for inside of a building that you could hear from a mixed use zoned home if, if you if that if that happened. And and that is kind of in the downtown area also like Berry Farms, but it was contemplated inside of a building. Yeah, we did have issues with that. But I did not read three uh, that way. But I didn't read it that way. Well, but you just said that the noise ordinance already prohibits on a sidewalk or public. Is it, so how does that contemplate inside building? I mean, you said you mentioned that when you were going through the slide that. Right. So, amp well, that's amplification on a sidewalk already is a no unless you get a permit. So when this already, is, all right, all right. So we've got two rules. We now have two rules. We, we now have, have a for on public property. Oh. And then this is really meant for if private. you are in in a private Understood. use. Right. Anybody else? You want to hear from uh, the speakers? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we're going to start with Autumn Daniels, followed by Gabrielle Wren, if you'll line up in that order, Bud Carmen, Justin Conley. That'll be the first four. You have two minutes. <laughs> no. 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 Each person has two minutes. Okay. Okay. You were first, Miss Daniels. Hello. Um, to be honest, I'm a little confused. <laughs> I thought uh, you guys were going to speak first, but um, I guess I'm just confused why we're arguing about public space. Um, I have been out with my parents the first year um, of them doing this. I went out with my friends just about every single Saturday night. Um, and just the testimonies that came from it were so powerful. Um, I had many friends that I actually met in the square and didn't realize till afterwards. And they came back and were like, hey, that one night in the square, you took a picture of me in front of the Christmas tree. And this is the reason I've side going to this church or whatever and I like didn't even remember I was like wow I didn't even um, remember that so I just God's definitely moving down there um, and I just yeah I just don't understand why we're trying to stop that I understand that there's safety that needs to be put in place um, but I feel like we're focusing more on something that hasn't happened than what is actually happening and I don't understand why we're focusing so much on um, permits need to be put in place. And if there's more than 20 people, when reality is in the past two years, there's maybe been 10 people out there on a Saturday. Um, and so I think we just need to focus more on the good that's coming out of it versus trying to prevent um, what could happen from this one thing. And just as like someone, I know a lot of people in here are a lot older than me and just from like people that are my friends that are in their 20s that have been down there um just the power that's come out of it and i just don't want that to stop um yeah there's just girls i've kept up with even since then that have said how much it has changed their lives being down there and going to the square and just being able to worship freely and just being able to see that and seeing like young people do it too not just um older people so yeah all I have to say. Thank you. Gabriel Wren. Good evening. Um, quick bit of background on me. I am a uh, retired military veteran. I also served as the veterans service officer for the county of Murray County under Andy Ogles. Um, 
I have a long history and tradition of standing up for freedom in every instance in lots of countries. There is an underlying tone to this whole thing, and everybody out there needs to understand this as well. This is not just about who's making noise, because right now as we speak, there is a gentleman wired up less than 100 feet from this building playing right now. Now, I don't know if that man's got a permit. I don't know if any of you do. But I don't see anybody rushing to stop him. And I brought up my service because this stuff matters to me. These rights that we have, the right to gather, the right to worship. Because it wasn't a community program that saved my life. It wasn't a community program that restored my marriage. It wasn't a community program that kept my kids with the father. It was people out on the street, men meeting in a barn, publicly displaying love for their fellow man. Now, I don't think anybody on this council is going to say that they support suicide, they support fatherless homes, or they support divorce. And if you stop what these people are doing out there, if your agenda is not solely based on what's the betterment of this whole community, then you need a heart check. Because what these people are doing changes lives, whether you agree with their position or not from a religious standpoint. I served in a country that was predominantly Muslim. I protected a Muslim culture that has been attacking Christians since the dawn of time, since their inception. And I still defended them with everything that I have. And I would defend that same Muslim culture if they were out there. Your time's up, Mr. Wren. Thank you. Thank I you. Yield. Mr. Carmen. And uh, Justin Conley, if you'll go ahead and line up, followed by Jeff Daniels and Jesse Hutch. If you'll go ahead and line up, please. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Stuckey and members of the Board of Mayor and Alderman. I appreciate the opportunity to tell you briefly how I feel. Probably haven't had time to read my written statement yet. Into the, am I doing this better? Is it better? Yes. Sorry about that. You probably haven't had time to read my statement. I submitted I read it, and it took eight minutes, so you can understand why I submitted it in writing, because I doubted seriously if I'd get eight minutes here. I can do the same thing in about a minute I could do in 24 hours, and that's to tell you that this ordinance was crafted, not developed and designed. It was crafted from day one, in part, not totally. I'm not saying there's no redeeming value in this ordinance, but I'm telling you for a fact that I can prove that this ordinance was crafted to deny the square prayer group from praying on the square on Saturday after 5 o'clock p.m. You say, well, how can you prove such a thing like that? Well, you might get a good start by just listening to what's said in private, right? And when you hear in private that we're finally going to get rid of them, it leads you in a direction of seeing why this ordinance was crafted. If you will recall at the last work session, staff was asked, can you put in, can you put together what we just said? I think I'm pretty close by that question. What was the response, or do you remember it? Was there an effort to say to you, this is what I heard and here are your options? No. What was said was, we need to keep the weekend portion in this ordinance. You're being led. It's as if you can't even think for yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, I respectfully request that you should have been told. We asked, and the question was asked, what, is the, what are the consequences of this ordinance to the prayer group? You got an answer, it's in writing, look at it. June the 21st of 2022. What was the answer? They can find another place. 
that you did not get this statement, which should have been said. This ordinance will prohibit prayer on the square on Saturday after 5 p.m. Had you been told that, you wouldn't have voted for that ordinance. No way would you have passed 2022-03, and you can't clean it up. Not when it started that bad. That's bad to the bone. It should be repealed. Start again. And I say this respectfully, as respectfully as I can. Please appoint a special gathering and expression committee. Okay? I mean, Williamson County set a pretty good example. They had a tough job to do when deciding what to do about this judicial center we needed. And they appointed a special courthouse study group. And they came up with some good ideas, built a garage out of it, serves us very well. And the judicial center had only one complaint. They moved it down in front of Lillibells, which we owned at that time, and put up, or we're going to put up a prison yard fence. But we got that stopped. What I'm suggesting to you is get a committee to discuss this. Oh, I hate to say this. I simply do not any longer trust administration. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Justin Conley. I'm one of the core members of this group. I have been for probably two years. Um, I just want to say, first and foremost, I respect all of you. I do not look at you as the enemy. I'm here to respectfully just share my opinion, um, what that is. So the square has been utterly life-changing. It is truly powerful. I know that this ordinance is not targeted at the message necessarily, and that is, I understand that there's safety concerns and all these other points, and that's valid and true. I'm not trying to beat around that. Um, but the square is life-changing. It is a move of God. You cannot deny that. If you haven't experienced it and have not been out there, you, you don't know. You have to come out. I don't know who of you is professing to be Christian and who isn't, but I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters right now. Please, this is a time to take a stand for your faith. This is a time to stand up for Jesus Christ. We need him. Our city needs him. We need to be bold. We don't need more churches. We don't need another church service. We need to be bold for our faith, and that's what the square is. We're not trying to be a public disturbance. We are not trying to be a nuisance. That is not our mission. That's not our heart. And if you've ever come out, you'll know that. You'll see that. Uh, we have since then gotten rid of one of the speakers, lowered the volume. We are trying to accommodate as best we can. We are never trying to bullying. That has never been our intention, and that's not who we are. Um, we are just trying to worship our God and our Savior and hope and pray that God is drawing people to repentance, to wake them up from this religious spirit that is on our city, that is on our nation. So I say it with, I understand there's concerns, and they're, they're valid, there are safety concerns, but we are not beckoning people to cross the street illegally. We're in the center of our city that is lit up like a candle. I mean, what are we going to do at night that's not going to be seen? The police station is less than a mile away. I mean, public safety, we're right in the center of town. If anything, add more patrols. Don't take it away from us to gather and make us get a permit every single week. That, that just doesn't make sense. We're not out here to come against you guys. I'm not out here to do that. And our mission is for Jesus. It's, it's just not a political thing for us. It is simply to push brothers and sisters to be bold for their faith, to stand up for their beliefs, and to not be afraid to worship God in public. Thank you. Oh. I hope respectfully you give me a little bit more time than two minutes. I really do. Um, you have two minutes, Mr. Daniels. I'm going to cut through the chase. I believe this is an attack on our group. And the reason I say that is because we're the only ones who are served with the ordinance based off of what Eric told me in a private meeting. No other person was served with that letter but me. I need to clear something up. That day that he served that paper on me, he said this. You need to turn the music off. I said, what if I don't? What will happen? You will be cited with a citation. I said, if I don't comply, what will happen? You can be arrested. I turned the music off because I didn't want to be arrested at that moment. I'm prepared to be arrested because I believe if you arrest me, this will become nationwide news. Just like the Ashbury revival going on in Kentucky, 
is becoming nationwide news. Do you think you have power over God? Absolutely not. God is going to move out there regardless of what you do, regardless of what I do. God is bringing revival to this city in spite of us, in spite of every one of us. You say you serve God, then serve him. Do what you're meant to do here. What Romans 11 says, you work for God, not man. I want to clear some things up. Someone said that I wouldn't be cited. You talked about it last week. I wouldn't be cited. I wouldn't be ticketed, and I wouldn't be arrested. I hope whoever said this can come out and say I said it. Because you know what? I'm bold enough to say it. October 15th, 2022, caller was an alderman, advised there are some individuals on the square with speakers and music they do not have a permit. He said, and I quote, they have been warned multiple times and I would like them cited with a ticket. You notice they said he. There's only three men that are aldermen. Someone's got to fess up. Somebody said it. Wasn't me. What I find so amazing is the policeman quoted back the city ordinance to you, which you should know. Amplification of sound located in within 100 feet of resident property line of a mixed-use development, which is plainly audible and prohibited between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. We're not 100 feet within residential property. We're further away than that. I got a newspaper article from the Tennessean. City Minister Eric Stuckey said, municipality staff have received complaints from multiple sources, including Downtown Franklin Association. Here's all the complaints from the city. I got every Saturday complaint from the city. Of this, there's five. Oh yeah, one was social distancing. We were accused of not social distancing. Oh yeah, we were accused of worshiping Jesus. Hallelujah. I worship him the rest of my life. Those are the kind of complaints you got. I hear multiple complaints. I heard from you written to my lawyer. Multiple complaints. When we all know in a court of law, you have to have evidence. I have evidence. There have not been complaints. <clears throat> You'll go ahead and be winded up, please, Mr. Daniels. I'm going to finish this. I also talked to the city of the Heritage Foundation chief offer operating director and managing director, Heidi, Heidi Head and Meg Hershley. I asked him, have you ever received a complaint about us in the square? Never. It was written in the Tennessee and that they have. So then I talked to somebody who knows the previous lady who was a manager of that. And she said that she had multiple complaints about everybody, but not many about us. I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to finish up, please. Well, I appreciate it, but I think you should give me more time because this has clearly been pointed at me since the last time we met because when I was up here and I sat down there, the people who spoke spoke directly to me. They didn't speak to here. They spoke to me. This is not about me. So I think respectfully you should give me time because everybody seems to say it's me. This is not about me. I'm just trying to be fair to everybody that wants to speak, Mr. Daniels. And Is anybody, would you give me your time to speak? I've already said that I'm not going to. Because you don't want me to speak. That's no, sir, that's means. not it at all. But I'm telling you right now. That's your opinion. God is speaking very loudly. And he is going to use what he's going to use to do what he has to do. And please don't think I'm attacking anybody. But I have to come with my evidence. I'm being accused of things. I'm hearing these complaints, this. 
You got the evidence. There's no complaints. But yet it seems to be, you don't want us out there singing Jesus songs. Well, guess what? Come Saturday, I'm going to be out there with my speaker, and I'm going to be singing Jesus songs, whether you like it or not. Mr. Hutch. Thanks for not risking. Mm -hmm. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, being that it's a day that's supposed to celebrate love, uh, I just love to say that I love you. And I can say that because Jesus Christ first loved me. I'm not going to stand up here and share everything in my life that's happened because I only got two minutes. But needless to say, I think could you, that. Could you give us your name, please? Yeah, Jesse Hutch. Uh, been married for 14 years and I have three young children. And we started driving from the Pacific Northwest and took three months to do it. And we said, God, where do you want us to live? And when we drove through Franklin, there was a peace that came upon us. And we stopped here. And uh, this community has truly been home. Like, it feels like I grew up here, when in actual fact, I grew up in Canada. And so I will share that when you see things in history, you got to learn from them. And then you don't want to do the same thing over and over and expect different results, because we know what that is. It's called insanity. <laughs> and so. I'll be honest, part of the reason that we started driving and moving was because our community changed, and I wasn't sure if it was a place that we could raise our children. We felt this was, and I still believe it is. I, I believe the community here, and I probably don't have to ask that from you guys because you're here because you love this community. You're a part of it. Uh, I think everybody's here because they love it, and that's the one thing that we all have in common, even if we disagree on an ordinance or a, an amplification system or et cetera, is that I think love will connect all that together. But I do have to say that this is the same vernacular and the same thing that happened in Canada, and now it's illegal for you to do any of this in Canada. You're, legally, you're actually considered a terrorist now, and that's if you stand outside as a single individual and you say, hey, I'd love to, you know, petition that the library get more books. <laughs> you know, you're legally not allowed to do that. And this is how it started. This is how it started with just stuff, little things like this. It was just little pieces and little things. So I just want to urge everybody to really consider how this all threads together because I think it's so important that we do it not just for us or an emotion that we're feeling in the moment, but something that actually is for the community. It will affect us now and it will affect our children and our children's children and so I just want to continue to urge because I, I, I feel there's love in this community it's crazy like I've never felt more at home in my life and uh, so that's why I'm here because I, I believe that that you guys have that too there's something in you that's like yeah Franklin's the bomb you know that so probably shouldn't say bomb but <laughs> don't 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 cancel me <laughs> so that's it uh, I love you I think you guys love everybody else I think everybody here loves everybody else here even if you've never met but uh, I'd love to see you all out in the square or the circle or whatever we call it, and because uh, it's kind of both. And uh, <laughs> let's shake hands and, and enjoy our community. But I think it is important for, for everyone to be able to share their heart and, and bring any type of ministry or, or concern to the public. And, and I think it could be done in a way, you know, that's uh, safe for everybody and it doesn't bother everybody while they're sleeping at night and et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you. Uh, next, uh, I've got uh, Steve Berger, Andrew Clark, and Jay Fryer. They'll go ahead and line up, please. And Mr. Clark, as you're coming up, I don't have your address. So as you make your, say who you are, if you get, list your address for us. Was I first, Mayor Moore? You're first. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Steve Berger. I've been a happy and proud participant in the Williamson County Franklin area for almost 29 years. Pastored one of the largest churches in Middle Tennessee for 26 years. My current office is a block from here on 103 Third Avenue North. I do life here in Franklin as does my kids and grandkids. To say that I was beyond concerned when Jeff first called me about the ordinances that were being discussed uh, would be an understatement. To think that the city of Franklin would even be considering anything that would infringe upon constitutionally guaranteed freedoms. That the city of Franklin that I know and love would be considering things that would hamper free religious expression 
that is in turn doing this service of community, uh, uh, doing this uh, community of service is unfathomable to me. We've met privately, uh, City Manager Stuckey, I respect you for that. I respect you, Mr. Mayor, for the conversation that we had. It was uh, pleasant, but I want to pick up with, with what Mr. Carmen left off with. This needs to be repealed, and it needs to be repealed immediately. I think you all have underestimated the graciousness that the community, the faith community, has expressed here. Because nobody's been irate and cussing and carrying on, maybe you think this isn't that big a deal to us. This is a massive deal. We're not going away. And unless this gets repealed, I can guarantee you this is going to be national news. And companies that have recently talked about moving to the city of Franklin, I guarantee they're going to be very concerned if this doesn't get repealed. So respectfully, hear what we're saying. We're not going away. We're not here to make trouble. We're here to serve this community, to be a blessing, but we're not going to be silenced. Not in the United States of America. It's not going to happen. Please repeal this immediately. <clears throat> My name is Andrew Clark, uh, 1205 Meadow Trace Court, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I want to address the idea that we're talking about disturbing the peace. One of the proofs I believe that this ordinance is targeting our group is because it seems to be centering around the idea of amplified music. Here we are in Middle Tennessee where when you go downtown Nashville, you can't even hear yourself think. But when you're in Franklin, you might hear the occasional street performer using an amplifier. The idea that worship music playing on the square at a volume where people can stand around the monument and converse in the same level as I am right now and hear each other clearly, I, I sincerely have to call that patently ridiculous. If, you know, you had up here squealing tires and engines racing, some people, you know, if you're trying to please everybody, some people call that a wonderful way to spend a Saturday night. Not myself, but if you're going to call worship music because it's amplified, disturbing the peace, you really need a gut check because this is America. We were founded on godly Christian principles. Uh, I think it was Matt, last week you, uh, you quoted 1 Peter 2.13 talking about, well, I got to pull, pull it up on my phone right here. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors or as to those who are sent by him for punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good you may put silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as a bondservant of God, honor the people, love the brotherhood, fear, fear God, and I'm not even going to say the last line because it says honor the king. If anybody hasn't noticed, we're in America. We don't have a king. We have a constitutional system that turned that whole thought process on its head. We elect public servants. We do not have to honor a king. We do not have to do whatever anybody else says. And thank God we live in a country where we can discuss these things peacefully and work them out peacefully. Thank you for listening. My name is Jay Fryer. I've lived here since 1997. Uh, came here out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, here's what I'll say, folks. I've been in these meetings before, and I've heard us talk about it being about protest, and then it's about noise ordinances, and it's always about something different. The fact of the matter is, this is about our First Amendment rights. It truly is, and I know others have said that before, but this is a classic example of people trying to step on those rights, and I understand that y'all are just looking at these bullet points and ordinances and things within your own framework of a constitution here in this city, but we've been given the right to go out here and in the public square and worship Jesus Christ. 
whether you agree with me or not, this nation was founded not just on Christian principles, it was founded on Jesus Christ. It was. We still put our hand on a Bible when we swear people into public office. The Supreme Court has said this is a Christian nation. The thought process around separation of church and state is a complete misnomer. It doesn't exist in any founding document whatsoever. This is supposed to be a Christian nation. And we look around at other cities across the country, especially on the West Coast or up in the Northeast, we see what happens when these type things start to take hold, right? Like people in, in, in Sacramento and in, in San Francisco and Seattle and Oakland and places like that, like they're Portland, like they can't do any of this. They've been stripped of their rights, especially as Christians. And, and you can sit here and say this isn't targeted towards Jeff and, his, and, and the, the folks out there on Saturday nights, but that is a clear targeting across this country of people that stand up for conservative Christian values in this nation. It's happening everywhere. Jesse pointed out it happened up in, uh, in, in Canada. We've seen it happen globally right now. And guess what? The Word of God told us this was going to happen. But let's be clear, guys. This is Franklin, Tennessee. This is a place where y'all can take a stand for our rights as Christians, and we need to be respectful of everyone else in this community, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, I don't care who they are. We need to be respectful of them. But this is a place where y'all have the opportunity to put your foot down and say, not here. Not in Franklin, Tennessee. We are going to stand up for our constitutional rights. We're going to stand up for the for the, for, the, for the Christian values that this nation was founded upon, people come to this little town. They move here because from California and New York and everywhere else because those places have been just totaled by, by things that are anti-Christian. And they move here because this, this city is up, a beacon please, of Mr. light. Fryer. Yeah, well, I hope you heard that. Thank you, sir. Okay, you've heard uh, a number of public comments, and uh, you still have the slide on the board about some of the uh, points that uh, we need some clarification on as far as this ordinance. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Go ahead, Alderman. I'll be glad to speak first. Um, I think we've already made some national news. Back on August 30th, 2022, this Tennessee town claims restricting protests helps facilitate the First Amendment. Printed that off online. We, we, we made the news almost immediately. I have gone back and listened to every work session, every BOMA session, every email I've had with city staff. Um, and I'll say it again, the second the staff brought this up, my first comment was, does this in any way restrict or could possibly harm the person who preaches praise and worships on Saturday night on the square? And the conversation was fairly sidestepped because it probably would not have looked good if they'd said what was <coughs> evident. Circumstantial evidence can show that yes, it actually does target Mr. Daniel's group. It's hard to sidestep that and say, well, it wasn't intended to, but the fact of the matter is, it's after five, it's after dark, on Fridays or Saturdays, and it meets weekly, and there's amplification. There's absolutely nobody else that fits that category. And it, it's a cause for concern of was it a deliberate act? Hopefully not. I would not like to think that staff would ever recommend something like this knowing that that's the intended consequence. Or is there some other person driving this agenda in this community that is anti-Christian or has a bias against Christianity? since I have seen other items that are precedent setting prior to this. And you do have to take that into account. And they are very close together on a timeline. So I don't really know, and I don't even want to go down that path because sometimes it's better to live in blissful ignorance than know the truth on some things. But I will say that if groups of 20 or more are going out to the Christmas tree to look at it, they 
could be in trouble for public expression because they're meeting more than 20 people after dark on a Friday or Saturday night. And it's true. It's, it's the way this is written. Um, I looked back at the July 12th work session. Specifically, it said Main Street. It, Shauna came out and said Main Street. Um, we're worried about Charlottesville, Virginia that happened in 2017, but this ordinance didn't come about until 2019. If there was such a panic about Charlottesville, what was the two-year delay to craft this ordinance to protect us from the rage of the world? Um, and then again, we enhance it again, but on February the 6th, we actually had a counterculture demonstration down here, a candlelight vigil that went off fine. We didn't have any problems with that. And it was kind of a contrast to what Mr. Daniels does. So it, it is interesting that when the police were called on October 15th, they actually cited the noise ordinance. They're as confused as anybody. They didn't cite this ordinance. They cited the noise ordinance. Um, and, and Mr. Daniels said that again, but I had noted that in what I went back through. This is not the Franklin that I came to. This is not the Franklin anybody expects. And I'm going to respectfully request that we repeal this ordinance. It is tarnishing this community. It is tarnishing our image. It is putting us in a financially liable situation as a community. And I think we need to repeal this. We need to work on our noise ordinance. We need to work on a nuisance ordinance because we have some bigger fish to fry in this community. And that's the path that we need to go down. And that is, is my comment about this ordinance. Thank you. Other comments? Alderman Brown. Sure, I'll go. It seems to me um, that we have what we need to protect us within the noise ordinance that we've got. I think the language is there that covers any kind of um, issue that we might run into, regardless of the topic, regardless of the who. It seems like it's already baked in there. I don't even know that it needs a whole lot more work, to be honest with you. And that was, that was the reason I was asking for it. I, to me, it reads like it's there. We've got a great police department. If they don't feel like there's an issue there, I, I trust our police department to manage that well. So if somebody's taking advantage of it, if somebody is is uh, disrespecting everybody else, um, then then the Norris ordinance is there to protect against that. And we have a great police department who can manage that. Uh, in my opinion, that that almost makes any other need for another ordinance to be mute. Because um, I think the biggest concern was the noise piece. So anyway, that's my two cents. Alderman Baggett. So, the make sure I understand this right, Shauna. The because there's been some conspiracies thrown out, quite frankly. That I don't. I, I'm, we're here to be pragmatic leaders of our community, and we need to deal in truths, and we need to deal in the facts, and we need to make sure that these folks are able to to express their faith, just like any other faith, on our public square, without government interference. I don't need all this other stuff about ulterior motives, and it's not what we're here for. We were elected to solve problems, and I believe protect our constitutional rights. So I think this board generally agrees, and that's, I apologize again. I'm, I'm, I am genuinely sorry if anyone felt that this board, who we, I happen to be a part of, was attacking you. I don't, there's, you know, whatever anyone thinks about motives or whatever, I'm not here for that, but we're going we're gonna to fix this um, and get this right for the community. So I'm sorry, that was a little digression. But if we remove this, and here's one thing that I can't, if we remove the amplification piece from this public expression ordinance, my understanding is there's already an ordinance on the books that would require a permit for amplification in the noise ordinance. So we created. If you if you want to make amplification okay across the city, we we'll probably need to go back. No, no, we don't want to do that. I don't. I don't think anyone wants to do and make amplify because we, that opens up a bit of Pandora's box, and I don't think the people here are really wanting 
us to do away with all amplification rules because there's some, some validity and some reasoning why we would want this. But we have one in our public expression ordinance number six, we have this amplification requirement for a permit, but I understood that the current no noise ordinance requires a permit for amplification on sidewalks as well already before this was even passed. So we kind of passed an ordinance to, it's kind of like double cover. Well, again, though, it doesn't, if it's at your own private place, there's no, there's nothing, no permit required. So if you're at a, if you have a restaurant and you That's have fine. Yeah. But if I'm on a sidewalk, I can, under the noise ordinance, if I'm on a sidewalk and I want to play music, uh, amplify music, and this special event ordinance doesn't exist, I still have to get a permit to have amplification on the sidewalk without this and listen i'm not trying to i, I know i could tell i'm putting you on the spot but i think no, that's important not, to so know i have a, so in because if we repeal this and that still exists yeah what have we really done so section 411-404 paragraph three sets out noises that the city long before you guys yeah like it's been the, around in the 90s and, and early 2000s yeah. decided we're loud, disturbing, and unnecessary, long, long before you. And if you read um, paragraph B, what, no, wait, hold on. Yes. Are you at 11, 406? 404. 404. Yeah, paragraph 3B says the using, operating, or permitting to be played, used, or operated of any radio, musical instrument, phonograph, loudspeaker, sound amplifier, or other machine for the producing or reproducing of sound that is broadcast upon the public streets for the purpose of um, commercial advertising or attracting the attention of the public um, to any building or structure is a... Is already declared to be loud, disturbing, and unnecessary. Okay, so why is there no, just to be honest with you, why do I believe that there's no, consp I mean, just talking to you, honestly, I believe most everything of what people said up here at the microphone, except the fact that this board is out to get Christians who amplify on the square. I don't believe that's true. This was on the books. And you, we've also had issues with some of the musicians downtown and asking them to stop amplifi amplifying. This was, yeah, this was on the books. You had had, uh, so anyway, uh, it was on the books, and there's a broader po policy reason why that exists. Nonetheless, we're here, um, and we need to, I think, uh, address this. I'd like to make, uh, I think, 20. I talked to Marvin um, uh, the other night at a Rotary event, and there's concern, real concern that, what if I have 25 people? And I know, I, I, th I just really think we need to, and maybe if we move it to 40, um, and that would also give the group a little more um, leeway, just because, I mean, who's to say 20 to 4? I mean, I, I would like to the staff to consider that, because I just, sure. I don't want people being afraid <clears throat> to go out on the square and, and gather. And, and if, some, if, if someone brings, you know, five kids and you've all of a sudden got more than you thought, like, yeah. I, I really want to protect that. And, and that's, that number is there to really help when people are planning an event or something's going on, what's the threshold at which you need a permit? And I'd be and, curious. And we know nobody can be perfect in what they plan and how many people show up, but it's the idea of that. I think uh, Sean identified that number is, is something that showed up in some, some case law, and so that's why we used it. Um, I think we talked about 50, we talked about 20 when this was done back in... 2018, 19, when the discussion started on this. Well, so, would the board um, weigh on that, maybe on the yeah, number are, of people? Those are all options for you. It is not meant to be like Understood. head counting and then, you know, going after people for it. It's meant to be, if you know your group's going to be a certain size, then, then, you, get a then you ought to pursue the permit yeah. so that we can be prepared for it. I'd like to raise that, though. That I would like the board to speak into that because I think the fewer permits, you know, for stuff like this, you know, we just don't need to get too involved, but I don't know. I'd be curious to other uh, input. I also, the nighttime situation, I think when we pass this, um, I don't know that we gave enough, and quite frankly, every single one of us up here, including those that are now offended, like we just didn't think about this 
enough. And I think that's a that's just me being honest. Like we didn't think this through as much. And you know what? <laughs> Qualities of a good leader, I think, are to say, you know what? Maybe we didn't get it right. So I would like us to look at that. And I don't think there's anything nefarious going on because it was we said at night. I think we just over. I, th I know I did. So I think we should look at, at allowing some nighttime allowances. And then the recurring events, you know, Mr. Young's group prays on Friday mornings, and sometimes they have 20, sometimes they have 40. You know, I, it just de depends. I want Mr. Young to have to, quite frankly, there's, you know, do a permit every time he wants to go out there and pray. Um, I think we should really look at the recurring events, maybe on off-peak hours. He can do it once. Like if it's not an, like a peak hour, like a, where there's high traffic, high con safety concern, we just one and done, and we kind of, you know, I, I, staff to consider that. Um, and then the amplification. This is where, uh, I don't know, there's just, because I said in the Tennessee, and if you're listening, you pull my Chris Tomlin quote, this, this is not the only music you can amplify, and I stand by that. It's not, Christian music isn't the only thing that can be amplified. Um, I happen to enjoy it, um, and I love what is happening on the square. But I think we have to really think about there's a middle ground here. There's a common sense answer here, and uh, it's not more government regulate an, an ordinance necessarily always. And a lot of times it's just coming up with something where the both parties agree. You know, this is what we're going to do, and and we can. You know, respectfully, I think, because you're people of faith, will respond and say, you know what, we don't want to disturb anyone around here. I think you kind of already said it up here, but how do you do, how do, you do that? Give staff some confidence, and here's what you're going to do, and, and maybe we can um, work around that. I, I do think that we're, the amplification is already on the books, sounds like. So if we repeal this, it's still there. So I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't have an answer to how to solve the amplification. It's already on the books. But I do know that we um, can't outlaw all amplification. I do know there needs to be a process to gain amplification. Yeah, I don't have any answers for that. Thank you. Alderman Brown, and then I've got Alderman Berger. I just, I just had a question. So on this number, I'll be honest, is there 100 people standing in that square praying? I, I wouldn't care. Yep. What matters? is obviously their safety. I mean, I, I, I got to believe they're going to be respect. Anybody who gathered out there, I would hope they'd be respectful enough to let people see the monument and do all that. The question becomes the safety piece. But I'll ask what I asked last time about the noise ordinance. Surely we have something already that if people start pouring into the street, into traffic, blocking traffic, doing all that, I would imagine we have something that addresses that. Not that that's going to happen. I'm just saying, again, I, I'm... I'm not sure I understand that we needed, if we have noise covered in another ordinance and we have a way of protecting people, if that group got so large that we had to shut a lane of traffic down, which I'm pretty sure we'd be pretty capable of doing if needed be, and it became a regular thing that we were having to shut down traffic, then I would hope that some folks would have a reasonable conversation with us about, hey, every Saturday we're having to show up to shut down traffic. By the way, that'd be pretty amazing if that actually took place. But I would hope at that point there'd be reasonable people would sit down and say, you're right, this is starting to become a burden on our police force, a burden on our city. Let's have a conversation. I don't think we're at that point yet, but I would assume if people start falling into the street, we've got some things to protect us there. We, I, I'm we trying really to not create. Don't. And, and I just well, I kind of then maybe want, we need to figure that yeah, out. I, again, this ordinance wasn't created because of prayer. This is not what this is about. It, but it was started because of the Charlottesville situation. It took us this long because we had to find out what, how other cities were reacting, what were they doing, how were they handling it. Again, it's really not about the you. what really, really kind of brought this together wasn't the purpose for the original permit. It was the counter protest. And as you remember, we had some protests and we had counter protests protesters and that we weren't we weren't prepared for either one we didn't know that either were coming and they had guns and they brought them in the square and they were threatening people you remember that that's where this came from this was the counter protesters pushing around some kids in the square that's what the, that's how this happened the problem was when, when we thought about the 20 we were thinking if it's big enough maybe that is when you get enough attention that counter protesters will come 
that that's where this kind of came from. We we did study a lot of case law about permitting. Uh, again, not about prayer. This is about protests and counter protests and the safety of our kids out in the square. And, and what the permit did is memorialized what we've done for years with people that communicate to us. We want to come down and do this. More often than not, people would reach out to us, and this is the kind of thing we talk about. How many people? Where do you want to be? How do we keep you safe? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, this really memorialized what we've, we've done. And if you look at how it's written, it's very narrow on what you can say no to. It's about if we can't support it with the staffing because something else is going on or whatever that might be. So it's really written for yes. Uh, and so I think that's important to, to realize that even if you do go down the path of, of still having the permit process in place, it's designed to facilitate it, not designed to deny it at all. Uh, and in fact, there's only been one the whole time we've ever had it <laughs> that was a, a, a no, and it was because we had, we were supporting the pilgrimage festival at the time, and we couldn't sh shut down a public street. Um, so uh, that, I think that gives you some other context too in terms of how, how we got there and what it, what it is intended to be. Um, yeah, so. And I will say the other thing about shutting down the streets, the only other avenue we had as far as shutting down the streets was for a special event permit, yeah. which requires your approval. So what we're trying to do is get to a place where we could shut down streets in a matter of maybe a day with the city administrator's approval. He doesn't have authority to shut a street down. He only has authority to shut the street down now because you gave it to him. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's your call. And that means we have to get something on an agenda in time to meet notification and then have you vote on it. And it's a slower process for a street closure than what we created, which is a matter of a day. Alderman Berger. Well, I need a break. I just feel like this is a tightly weaved web every time I look at it. Um, you know, I'm with you, Alderman Hanson. I think this needs to be rescinded. I think we need to start over. I think it's too complicated to build back on it. I, I just think there's too many things here. We talk about amplification. It's actually covered in the noise ordinance, and I think we should enhance the noise ordinance if we need to and address some issues in that noise ordinance if we so choose. Then we have the... So if you rescind this particular ordinance, uh, that application goes back to the noise ordinance. It gets rid of the Friday and Saturday evening issue or after dark issue. Now, I have not any problem with saying, you know, events can't take place and groups can't meet and all that stuff after 10 o'clock or something. Nothing ever good comes after midnight around people being out in the streets and groups and stuff. And I think there is a safety factor there, you know. But we, you know, really from the First Amendment right, we really, really couldn't prevent them in the long run to do not do that. So then that's the Friday and Saturday evening after dark and the reoccurring events. I think we need to get rid of all that. I think, you know, we were trying our best to create something that was helpful to everybody. So the other thing I have a problem with is, you know, and I know other cities have permits. We're not we're not alone. But maybe we call it a scheduling of events, scheduling of a group or of a gathering rather than a permit. Because permits, I don't know about you all, but when you hear the word permit, it's like, permit, you can get it or you might be not get it. And Eric, you said, you know, we're not in the business of trying to deny permits. Of course we're not. But it, it just has bad connotation to me, the word permit. So, you know, you want to play around with words that makes everybody feel better, get rid of the word permit and make it more to say, hey, we just want to schedule events. People can get online. We, we call in to do it now. Maybe we just have a thing on our webpage where people can call in. They don't call in. They just get on there, schedule their event. They print out the information, right? It tells them what they can do, where the restrooms are located, what they can do, and all this stuff. And then when they sign up for that, Monique or whoever is in charge of that calls them and says, hey, we see you schedule an event. Uh, great. And then somebody else goes on there and they go see that that particular square or park or something is already booked. So we don't have competing people trying to, to use it. And if you could see actually a calendar on there, that might be helpful to people. 
Uh, I just want to simplify this. I don't want to reinvent the wheel all the time. I just want to simplify it. I, th I hear everybody saying, you know, let's uncomplicate this. Um, um, uh, no ordinance. I, I don't think we need an ordinance to speak to smaller groups. I think we had to get rid of it. I don't think we need an ordinance to speak to smaller groups. Events can be scheduled. Um, and they can occupy a space, as I said, if we can do a scheduling calendar uh, and spontaneous or planned events. Spontaneous events can happen right now. They can right. happen tomorrow mm -hmm. and work. We can't do a darn thing about it because, and we don't really want to. But Eric is a city administrator and mayor is mayor. So Ken, Ken is a mayor. And us as aldermen, we have a responsibility to make sure that we're trying to speak to the issues that may or may not, you know, may, that that are in our purview of safety. We do want that, but not at the expense of the First Amendment right and and our God-given rights. And to me, that's even more important. And so um, sometimes I think we're trying to get an answer or solve a problem that really doesn't exist. And sometimes we have a tendency, and I'm not saying it's wrong, Police chief sitting over here and our police officers here and everything. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I think it's smart. But we don't need to react to everything that's happening around the country. Just because Charlottesville, I used to live in Charlottesville, lived there for six years. Every, just because something went berserk in Charlottesville, is it going to happen here? No. But from our police department standpoint, is it wise to think through those things? Absolutely. And wants to be thinking through those things. And sometimes those things get concerned and then we put them in ordinances. And it's like one more ordinance, one more thing to speak to. I mean, if you look around the country at all these things that are happening, we could be sitting here all day long writing all types of ordinances. And then we dig our hole and we get deeper and deeper into it. So I don't want to react to everything. I do want to be smart. I do want to plan. But I don't want to write an ordinance for everything. Um, and of course, uh, people have that First Amendment right to show up. And I want us to get out of the business of squelching that. And I don't think there's anybody here, including administration, staff, anybody, that intended to target anybody particularly or to make it hard for people in our community to live free, a free country, their First Amendment rights with our God-given rights. So I would like to see us rescind it. I'd like to see us address the ordinance of, uh, of the amplification, because that could be a little little tricky there. And, and then come back and see, is there anything else particular that really should be addressed because of, and we'd have to have a darn good reason to do that. So that, that was- Before be I go to Alderman Baggett, Thank is there you. anybody else wants to speak on this? I'm gonna go to them, but before, unless there's some rebuttal or something that, so. Um. Well, my com my comment would be fairly simple. How do you accommodate the next group that comes in that wants the square for a meeting themselves? It doesn't have to be a religious meeting. It can be some other meeting. And they want to meet Saturday night. How do you accommodate them? Because they're saying they want it every Saturday night. Every Friday night, if I, if I guess, uh, if I remember correctly, how do you accommodate somebody else that has just as much right to something to, to do something on that square? We've had weddings on the square. If you want to have a wedding, how would you schedule your wedding on either a Friday or Saturday night? Let's say that you did it two months in advance. Does that, does that preclude this group from being there on that Saturday night? Does it? Well, it, we do have a provision for a permit, both you have a special event permit and you have um, what we've talked about here, which is the public expression component. If someone has a permit granted, they get to use the space. They get to use it. Okay. Yeah, and, and there are thresholds that the special event permit below a certain size uh, that the uh, city administrator can issue it. Uh, there is a process we go through where it's reviewed by our special events team because it's got, you know, public safety personnel, public works folks, uh, et cetera, that, that analyze it and make sure we're 
able to support the event and what resources need to be in place to support the event. So you have that mechanism through which anyone can get, whether you call it a scheduling or a permit, but get the right to use the public space. All right. Follow in pots. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. But I do want to say if there isn't a permit and there are people in the square and there's multiple or even opposite, there's, there's nothing we would do. If, if there's not a permit required, um, has, as we have done in the past when we had yep. the two or three competing and, and some brought weapons, we just, we just watch and we, that's really kind of, we try to separate as best we can, but um, if, if there's no permit, no one has the exclusive right to it. You know, when we do have special event permits, that is an, an exclusive right to the, to the area, but um, probably not much of anything other than just watch. Go ahead, Alderman Potts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I just, we, we are getting into the bigger issue here, but I also wanted to redirect a couple of the, um, the speakers that spoke tonight, and uh, I want to acknowledge uh, a couple of things. And Mr. Clark, uh, you summed it up, and, you know, thank God that we do live in a country where we can discuss, and I don't know where you're sitting, but thank God that we do live in a country where we can peacefully and respectfully have discussions like this. And I think that was a great summary. I appreciate you saying that. Also, Mr. Connolly, um, thank you for being respectful, but also being bold with your faith and carrying that forward wherever you are here in the audience. Um, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's others that I had taken uh, lots of notes here. And I'll be brief because I know that we do have other speakers, and I say that, and I feel like I'm never brief. We have uh, 16 more items. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the polite reminder. In that case, boom, boom, boom. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know who all comes and joins uh, Mr. Daniels and the rest of the group uh, on Saturday night, but I did on Saturday the 4th came out there after we had buried my father-in-law and shared with you and felt led to come over there and just talk to y'all. No other reason other than that, just like I shared with you. There was no political purpose. There was no knowing that we were going to have the opportunity tonight where it would kind of bridge in right there as God leads us that way. But I was there. Y'all are doing a great thing. And being bold and being respectful, and as y'all said, being inclusive as people want to come into that area. And there is a delicate balance right there. But I, I appreciate and value how you brought me in to that group. And, and I also sincerely appreciate, as I said that night, how y'all prayed over me and my family and our grieving. And I'll go ahead and tell you, you there were a lot of people that prayed over us over the past couple of weeks. But that one... That one was special to me, and I walked away in tears, all right? I also came back the next Saturday, but you didn't know it. I needed quiet time to myself. So I sat on a bench right outside the old courthouse for about 35 minutes by myself. And I'll go ahead and tell you, I thought about coming over, but I wanted to also be an observer, and I wanted just to see how you were because I hear it and we hear the, the talking about it. The amplification and there was a gentleman here who said we've decreased the count of speakers. The amplification could barely be heard over the cars. I don't have a problem with that. All right. I didn't have a problem with it when I made a telephone call back in October. I was calling on behalf of a, of a resident and I apologize because you got misinformation there were probably two, maybe three telephone calls that evening. I was in Memphis, Tennessee. I called the first time to say, hey, non-emergency telephone number, you know, for Franklin police. This is what, uh, what I called on. I'm at an event. Would you just call me back? Just let me know it's closed out because I know we just passed this. They called me back and they said, you know something? We don't even have it on record. We're going to have to research it. We're going to have to call you back again. And I said, look, and at this point, y'all are gone. And I said, there's no need to cite. I said, educate and inform. That's what we do with brand new ordinances. That's how we should operate. So I apologize that you got misinformation, but that's not how I operate. And I would never say cite, cite, cite. That's not how it works. I just want you to know that. Um, 
uh, and I just, and I know we're short on time, but I, I do think that we do need to seriously take consideration. This was never the intent to get us down this path of where we are right now. There, there's all those safety concerns that have been brought up in the other groups and what happens and how do we manage it as a city? Because that's what we're elected to do is to manage our city and make sure that all of our Franklin residents and anybody that visits is safe in the manner in which they want to be here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Alderman Baggage, you've got the closing comment. No, I've got Alderman Blanton. I'm going to go to her. Go her first. Come back to you. Um, so it's interesting. I love that we continue to dialogue, and I think that's healthy. Um, I'm not seeing this as spiritual warfare. I believe that that's probably... I'm not going to put words in your mouth. I understand you feel like you're fighting a good fight, and I respect that. Um, for the most part, I know the hearts of the people I serve with, and I don't think anybody here is, is wearing that title or wearing that hat. And I hope you feel that just as much as we try to feel the respect coming from you. The same is being done on this side of the table. Um, you talked about your list of evidence, and I appreciate that. There's also, and for me personally, there were... Facebook messages, there's been audible face conversations that aren't going to go through a public records request. So I've had more people go, what is going on down here? What is going on with our town? I can't even go out there and go to Baskin Robbins, which tells you how long ago that was because they're not there anymore, and do X, Y, Z. Or when I drive through town, what's going on? I didn't know what was going on because I'm at home with my family typically on a Saturday night. As a grandmother now, that's my happy place. Um, but for us, and I've said this before, it's about striking a balance because we not only have to um, achieve a balance for the constituents we serve, but the people who want to come into our community and use our public spaces. Um, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. I didn't instigate this ordinance, but we have to take things that are put before us for whatever reason or way they came here. Um, I said last time I was fine with how it was written. I am also just as fine today to look at it a little differently and make sure that we're, we're striking that balance and being fair. And I think um, we also have to make sure that our public spaces, and here we go looking at you again, but you were the loudest voice. We have to make sure our public spaces are available to everyone. And I think when we talk about the dark and we talk about Marvin Young's group versus your group, why is it different or why is the daytime is a big thing. It's easier to protect people during the day than it is at night. And so I think that could be an organic way of how that came about without it being directed at you. Um, I haven't attended one of your gatherings, like I said, but um, I do hope and appreciate that as you continue to do this, that you're hyper aware, I'll look at Steve, that you're hyper aware of other people that want to have the same opportunity, pleasure and joy out of being in that public space, whether they want to sit on a cannon or whether they want to take a picture, I don't know. Um, it's, it's not an easy task to strike that balance. Or the picture takers, yeah, it's a tourist town. Um, you're out of order, I'm sorry. But, it, but it's almost as if you've taken up residence in our public square um, without having, and, and I, this sounds awful, so it sounds antagonistic, taking up residence in our public square and making it your event venue, you know? Um, and again, I applaud your ev evangelism, and I know that people get called to different places to do different things, but... Um, it, that could be a vantage point from somebody other than a believer. So I'm fine to look at it a little bit more um, just so that we're trying to get more of a le level playing field. In order to give staff, I'm going to be quick, in order to give staff guidance on where to go next, here's the reality. The reality is you can do a permit, Mr. Young can do a permit for every event with amplification, and there's really no reason why the city can deny it. So why can't we look at, unless there's some conflicting situations in the square is that accurate you, they could do one for need to address what's in the ordinance now which says which that this restricts just restricts friday and saturday yeah, yeah. and it's, restricts reoccurring events 
It doesn't to restrict once it. Once per month. It does it restrict it, or does it just say that what is what Permitted triggers once per month? It triggers the permit the if permit it's more is than allowed once. once per month. Yeah, Th this situation, this group, except for the amplification, is a non of non non offending. Permit yeah. doesn't matter. Don't need it. Except for the amplification. The amplification has been established as a threshold for a permit. So I would I want us so to once you get in the permit, then you get into that restriction of the Friday Saturday hours, the after dark. Or the um, the reoccurring. Well, I, I, I think repe I think repealing everything is is probably a mistake. I think coming up with a situation where we address the nighttime situation, okay, addressing the nighttime item, coming up with a way because here's the reality: not everyone is wanting to pray on the square, and having a a, a permit process for the the not you all makes sense. Uh, but also not making you do a permit every time you want to come to the square is also makes sense. So some kind of like a re reoccurring something, re they could do it one, one and done. And then I would think that in a spirit of hospitality, that if there was a wedding that wanted to be on the square and the city reached out and said, hey, you'll, but if there, I would think there would be some kind of coordination. I mean, the reality is, is they can try to get a permit. They can do a permit. Fine, quick. <laughs> well, did you all have guidance from us no, after all of that really don't. grandstanding? Hear some people saying we yeah. feel it all. Some people saying yeah. And so we need some solutions. I'm sorry about that by saying I, I, I'm open to your guidance. Yeah. It, but it, it's, sure but let's take it off the public square. Let's put it at Bicentennial but Mall. Anywhere, they have the right to be anywhere. right. But that is that is also when somebody takes up a continual. I mean, every week, every Saturday night, it makes the rules change a little bit. But, but if it's a place that other people might want to use as well, you know what I'm saying? But it's America, but, but, and you can you can go to the public square that. every yeah. Saturday. I mean, okay. it just is. Yeah. I mean, I know. I, I trust me. I would prefer that maybe they weren't out there every Saturday night and let other people use it too. But the reality is, yeah. this is America, and that's like, right. if they want to, that's the. I mean, it's just. And may, may I weigh in with you all because um, this is really good discussion and I think this will help with direction. We're, we're basically saying the same thing here. And, and if group A wants to show up with 10 people and group B wants to show up with 20 people and group C wants to show up with two people or three people, they can do that. They have, they, there's a big square and they can do it. And uh, hopefully people will be respectful of each group and if they're not, then, you know, they have to take care of it or, you know, get some help for it. But I don't think we ought to invent a problem that doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. And um, so they can do that. But then if somebody reserves the square for a wedding or for some kind of demonstration or whatever, all bets are off. You, anybody that shows up uh, with no permit that just wants to pray or sing or hang out, or look at chip, whatever they want to do. They are going to say, hey, it's been reserved. It's like going to a pavilion at the park. People can't use, if you've paid money and you're going to the pavilion and you've got it reserved for your family reunion, take a hike, people. You know, we've got it because we are registered with the city. And that then everybody's respectful. And, they, and I don't think we need an ordinance to spell that stuff out. I really don't. I, I don't want to invent the problem again and try to try to address the answers before they happen. If down the road, down the road, it's a consistent problem, we end up having that, then we have to address it. Hold on, so Baggett, I think, were you I think finished? that works out. Yeah. You know, if we repeal this, you still have the noise ordinance that requires a permit to use an amplification. So I, I just, what on I'm... Right? No, on the public sidewalks, if you have well, amplification. Well, then we're going back. I'm, all I'm saying, I think we can f fix this one. And if there's some willingness with the groups to we'll remove the nighttime items, because I think that was an inadvertent oops. And then I think the amplification, again, a long-term permit is, again, if we remove this, there's still a noise ordinance that requires a permit for amplification. We'll be back here square one, because we'll still have to have a permit to, for the old rule, old law. So why don't we have a way to allow Mr. Young's group, 
this group that comes out on the square regularly, quite frankly, the only two that do it. That's why I'm being kind of singled out because there's no one else that uses the square all, you know, consistently every time. So let's come up with a long-term permit that uh, provides them some priority. And if there's someone else that comes in to the city to do a special event permit on the same night as theirs, then no, then we'll, we'll, we'll bring that to their attention. I mean, b b or else they're going to have to get a permit every time they want to use amplification on the square, even if we repeal this. We I think that's the priority. How do you do that? You can't give people priority. You just talked about scheduling got priorities. Yeah, but that's events. That's over 20 or what you want This is an event. All right. Not under 20. Anyway, thank you. Let's, Appreciate let's, it. Let's move on. We could. Under 20. Items four and five have to do with rezoning and a development plan for my friend's house. If y'all please be quiet as you leave. Any questions about that? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, good evening. Um, this should hopefully be pretty straightforward. Um, my friend's house is a group care facility that's been in Franklin for over 25 years. Um, they are wanting to increase their bed count from 8 to 12. Uh, the current facility that was built a few years ago um, has the capacity to have 12 beds, but once you have more than 8 beds, which is what they currently have, it's classified as a group home and must be rezoned, and that's why they're here today with the plan district and a development plan. No, yeah, no. It's just more allowable people in a building that can, can accommodate it. Yep, yes. using the same facility, they don't plan to make any additions at all. Items six, seven, and eight. Uh, this has to do with the plan of services for annexation for the property located South Murfreesboro Road and East Ridgeway Drive. And also the uh, annexation of said annexation property zone, yeah. and also um, an ordinance as far as zoning. Zoning, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll be um, brief. Um, the adopting the plan of service is essentially um, a, it outlines how infrastructure will need to be provided to this lot. We've had conversations about this um, before. Um, it's in the Watson uh, Branch Drainage Basin, which is entirely composed of existing city properties. So this is one of the last remaining to be annexed. The properties within Millcroft and Services area um, and water availability will be approved and provided by Millcroft and prior to the annexation. Um, the owners not required to extend it, um, the sanitary sewer to provide service to the property as an existing sewer main is present on the property. Access is provided off of Mur Murfreesboro Road. Um, the development of this property is limited to uh, due to steep slopes present on the site and no additional manpower or equipment will be necessary for either fire, police protection or sanitation. Um, Mr. Mayor, would you like me to do these all as one item? Please. Okay, Please. just continue. Um, in regards to the annexation of the property, again, I mentioned it's in the Watson drainage, uh, Watson branch drainage basin. Um, Envision Franklin has this in the single family design concept, um, and there's no additional plan for further development of the property um, that's been submitted at this time. The applicant does intend to subdivide the property into two single family residential lots um, with the associated zoning. The um, Zoning that's referenced is um, for, to zone the properties, ER. Um, a zoning district has to be assigned to any annexed property that's being submitted. If they don't request a specific zoning, staff will designate either AG or ER. In this case, ER is the most appropriate. Um, the FMPC recommended approval for this by a vote of nine to zero, and staff recommends um, if you um, find it to be in the best in in interest of the community to approve it. Everybody good? Nice job, Chelsea. Okay, um, item nine is a resolution 2022-83 amending the Coletta Park PUD subdivision <laughs> to extend the vesting rights for the property located northeast of South Carruthers Road and <laughs> south of Murfreesboro Road, establishing a public hearing. 
I might say that there was one email uh, today that I received that apparently there's uh, some uh, vehicles and uh, some construction traffic that's around Beacon Hill Drive where this particular person lives. Uh, I don't think that has anything to do with Coletta Park, but I say that just so staff knows that they can address that issue with this particular homeowner. Um, and this is something we've been doing on a regular basis is extending vesting rights. So uh, I don't think anything else other than uh, we've gone through Coletta Park enough <laughs> in the past, haven't we? So if, is it okay to keep moving along? Uh, how about uh, item 10, which is uh, consideration resolution 2023-02, a resolution authorizing the use of competitive seal proposal procurement method for choosing the service provider for voluntary products for employees for a term of award. This is for a group term life, voluntary group term life and voluntary short term disability. This just says we can go out and do a competitive process. Item 11 is a resolution 2023-06, the resolution to allow reporting of City of Franklin contract number 2022-0061, an addendum for the City of Franklin to participate in the State Tennessee Purchasing Card Program without disclosing the name of the financial institution of a participating entity. So this uh, is a request by the state to not identify the financial institution that we're using off of a state contract. So they've asked us to do this. We'll amend this agreement to remove the name of that financial institution at their request. It's strange, I have to admit. But it's, <laughs> but it's on the card. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's what the state asked us to do. So we are following through. We're following that. directions. Item 12 is City of Franklin contract 2022-0029, a memorandum of understanding between the City of Franklin, Tennessee and Williamson County, Tennessee concerning application of building and code requirements. Um, this is property that is located, it sort of straddles city and county um, and it's the new juvenile services facility, some other development in that area. And it essentially is an agreement to um, follow city site development standards um, while they still operate uh, under the county guidance. So it's a kind of an agreement to work together as they develop this, develop and redevelop this site. Uh, number 13 is uh, deny sewer availability for six unaddressed properties uh, with all those numbers and 1546 West Harpeth Road. I don't mind reading all the numbers. Please don't. Uh, we've asked to defer that to the February 28th meeting right. because yeah. the uh, owner is This not property owner is not here. We've had a couple questions about it. This does seem to reflect what you've already kind of given us guidance on in adjusting the UGB, but uh, since they're not here and there have been a question about it, we would ask to defer this to the 28th. This is also on your voting session. 28th of February, yeah. And uh, 14 is the nice sewer availability for 1126 Warrior Drive. Uh, this is um, in the Red Wing uh, neighborhood, so outside the city limits. There is no close um, sewer to serve this property uh, within reasonable distance. Um, the applicants have requested denial, and we are um, recommending denial. Mm -hmm. Uh, 15 is amendment to the City of Franklin contract number 2016-0152 with CDM Smith for sanitary sewer model assistance for a not to exceed amount of $50,000. This is just typical on-call modeling um, for our sanitary, uh, I'm sorry, for our sewer model. Uh, CDM does that work. This is in our budget in the water, um, the wastewater operating budget. Um, they've been helping a lot with some of those NIOP responses. So this is just an amendment that was, we had allotted for them this year. 16 is City of Franklin contract 2022-0289 with CDM Smith for water reclamation facility rehabilitation and resiliency design for an amount not to exceed $1,737,669 for design and construction services using the American Rescue Plan Act funds. So this is a contract um, with CDM to do some more uh, resiliency work at the wastewater plant that we have found during the construction that we're doing right now, um, we weren't able to kind of get into basins and to uncover some of the filter media 
that when QWIT did that work that we realized we needed to do. Um, so we're using um, some of the, Ameri the ARPA funding to do that work. Um, in the memo, there is the amount that will be reimbursed for this design work, and then the construction will follow after this. So it's a 65% funding through the TDEC, uh, American Rescue Plan funding. This doesn't come out of our funding. Well, our match will come. 30, our match. 35% is our match. But it won't, okay. okay. 17 is City Franklin contract 2022-0324 with C&T Engineering for Harpeth River monitoring and data collection for a not to exceed amount of $56,000. So as part of our uh, discharge permit that we have um, for the Harpeth River for our Claudia Yates facility, we have to monitor the river at certain locations. Um, we had an employee that was doing this work internally, but um, had a minor uh, slippage accident and is um, now on workers' comp, and I would just like to have someone else come and do this work. <laughs> so this will be in, this, I've got, we're moving projects around, I've got money for this, and I'll put this in our budget the next following years. And for how long are we doing that? We won't take that back on ourselves? Uh, we, we may at some point in time, but I also, um, when the requirement came in our last discharge permit to, to monitor for water quality, um, the intent was for us to kind of, we were going to do a lot of data gathering and, and evaluate the data. And with our workload right now, I just don't necessarily have, have time to, to monitor the data. So I just would like an outside person to help me get a better track on that. Um, and we are funding that. It's 56000 Just. I'm sorry, I didn't. The I funding didn't. of 56000 right? Yeah, so we have, we have in our, it's, um, in, in it's your, out of both the water plant and the wastewater plant okay. operating budgets. Thanks. Okay, uh, 18 is City of Franklin contract 2023-0010 with AECOM for engineering services during construction for the water treatment plant valve access improvement project for an amount not to exceed $62,074. So this project, um, this amount was budgeted in our operating fund. Um, we are constructing a mezzanine at the water plant to access some valves. AECOM is the engineer of record. And so this is just ensuring that um, they're able to make as built appropriately and, and stamp those. And lastly is review and discussion of the study area and criteria for evaluating alternative sites for our new city hall. So this is a follow-on to the discussion we had um, several weeks ago as we look at alternative sites uh, uh, other than where we are today. Uh, as that process moves forward, we want to kind of give you an update on that and then talk about some general criteria that might help guide our evaluation of those sites versus this site. Um, so Vernon's worked with our team on, on developing that, getting that started, and so we'd like to walk you through that and also maybe give an update on the appraisals that appraisals that are been um, contracted for thank you Eric mayor Alderman uh, back in January we had the discussion about exploring alternative sites and um, we have uh, are in the process of obtaining two independent appraisals for this site so that's the first piece of it the second piece is uh, several of my colleagues and I met to start looking at what criteria we would use to give you an objective assessment of what it would take to look at an alternative site, we, we determined that we need some criteria to work from. And we, we hope that my presentation this evening will get us there. And the first one in is the map that is, it's of the Central Franklin and Columbia Avenue corridors. So the area highlighted in pink, appropriately for Valentine's Day, is, um, is the area that we would be looking at. It's in central downtown. And if, if that is uh, appropriate for yourselves, at least it gives us an area that we can start to look at, at land values and the type of infrastructure. The second criteria of, of the four is making sure that, of course, the zoning ordinance and the zoning district permits a, a civic use, as such as a city hall and or commercial uses. The third of four is that the site has to be large enough and we would look at a minimum of, of two acres in size. And again, this is hypothetical, but it does give us some parameters to, to look at. And then, of course, the site has to accommodate approximately a, a 100,000 square foot building and 300 parking spaces in accordance with our zoning requirements. 
And if those parameters, that criteria are sufficient, we'll be coming back um, in March when we expect, late March, early April, when we expect to, to have the two appraisals in our possession. One thing I would comment or get maybe ask for some feedback. Uh, and the staff team in looking at this used existing overlays. So it makes it pretty big. I mean, it's kind of inside the Mac Hatcher loop. I'm not sure if that's exactly what your intent is. So is, if there's a way for us to narrow that for some boundaries that make more sense to you, that might get us to a better, more comparable value as we do sort of the hypothetical calculation. That's, that's one reaction I had when I saw it, but I understand why we ended up with this. I, I mean, I'll, I'll just say that's way too big. Um, I think it needs to be downtown and, and maybe the Columbia um, one, but but that's that's way too big of an area. It it needs to stay in the core of downtown, in my opinion. Columbia to where um, you say Columbia one. There's a there's three different Columbia. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm saying okay. I wouldn't go past Columbia District one personally. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. I I think to stretch too far, we're we're going well outside of the core downtown. I think we're losing the intent of what downtown. City. To do the diligence, but now we're starting to go. We start hitting Matt Hatcher. We've, we've gone way outside of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if it's okay, what we'll do is we'll look at a, 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 a radius off the center of downtown and we'll look at a half mile and a, a mile for starters. Mile and a half gets us out to Matt Catcher yeah, on the northeast, <laughs> northeast corner. So we know that's too far based on what you said. And I'll share that with Eric. Maybe he can share it with you in his weekly update if that's good. The other uh, piece that I just want to give you a heads up on is that in two weeks, uh, we had uh, planned and promised, and we expect to be before you at the work session um, with uh, some of the information from, from Bob Gibbs, our uh, consultant on the retail space. And at that time, it is our intention to show you uh, some initial illustrations of how the building looks on the exterior, and it will set on, on the square. So that's in two weeks. And we'll look forward for your guidance of whether or not to include the retail space. And so, thank you. Thank you. Record time. <laughs> We're adjourned. Come on, do me there, Clyde. <laughs> <laughs>